Welcome to my humble abode, darlings. Come in out of the rain and get comfortable. I have a story to tell you, and I hope you enjoy. If you do, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The Island of Dr. Moreau, Chapter 4 At the Schooner's Rail That night land was sighted after sundown, and the schooner hove to. Montgomery imitated that it was his destination. It was too far to see any details. It seemed to me then simply a low-lying patch of dim blue in an uncertain blue-gray sea. An almost vertical streak of smoke went up from it into the sky. The captain was not on deck when it was sighted. After he had vented his wrath on me, he had staggered below, and I understand he went to sleep on the floor of his own cabin— the mate practically assumed a command. He was the gaunt, taciturn individual we'd seen at the wheel. Apparently he was in an evil temper with Montgomery. He took not the slightest notice of either of us. We dined with him in a sulky silence after a few ineffectual efforts on my part to talk. It struck me, too, that the men regarded my companion and his animals in a singularly unfriendly manner— I found Montgomery very reticent about his purpose with these creatures and about his destination, and though I was sensible of growing curiosity as to both, I did not press him. We remained talking on the quarter-deck until the sky was thick with stars, except for an occasional sound in the yellow-lit forecastle and a movement of animals now and then. The night was very still. The puma lay crouched together, watching us with shining eyes, a black heap in the corner of its cage. Montgomery produced some cigars. He talked to me of London in a tone of half-painful reminiscence. He asked all kinds of questions about changes that had taken place. He spoke like a man who had loved life there and had been suddenly and irrevocably cut off from it. I gossiped as well as I could of this and that. All the time the strangeness of him was shaping itself into my mind. And as I talked, I peered at his odd, pallid face in the dim light of the binnacle lantern behind me. Then I looked out into the darkening sea, where the dimness of his little island was hidden. This man, it seemed to me, had come out of immense tea merely to save my life. Tomorrow he would drop over the side and vanish again out of my existence even had it been under commonplace circumstances, it would have made me a trifle thoughtful. But in the first place was the singularity of an educated man living on this unknown little island, and coupled with that, the extraordinary nature of his luggage. I found myself repeating the captain's question. What did he want with the beasts? Why, too, as he pretended that they were not his when I had remarked about them at first? Then again, in his personal attendant, there was a bizarre quality which had impressed me profoundly. These circumstances threw a haze of mystery round the man. They laid hold of my imagination and hampered my tongue. Towards midnight, our talk of London died away, and we stood side by side, leaning over the bulkwards and staring dreamily over the silent, starlit sea, each perusing his own thoughts. It was the atmosphere for sentiment, and I began upon my gratitude. If I may say it, I said after a time, you saved my life. Chance, he answered, just chance. I prefer to make my thanks to the accessible agent. Thank you, no. You had no need. I had the knowledge, and I injected and fed you as much as I might have collected a specimen. I was bored and wanted something to do. If I'd been jaded that day, or hadn't liked your face, well, it's a curious question where you would have been now. This dampened my mood a little. At any rate, I began. It's a chance, I tell you, he interrupted, as everything is in a man's life. Only the asses won't see it. Why am I here now, an outcast from civilization? Instead of being a happy man enjoying all the pleasures of London— simply because eleven years ago I lost my head for ten minutes on a foggy night. He stopped. 
Yes, said I. That's all. We relapsed into silence. Presently he laughed. There's something in this starlet that loosens one's tongue. I'm an ass, and yet somehow I would like to tell you. Whatever you tell me, you may rely on me keeping it to myself, if that's it. He was on the point of beginning, and then shook his head doubtfully. Don't, I said. If it's all the same to me, after all, it is better to keep your secret. There's nothing gained but a little relief if I respect your confidence. If I don't, well... He grunted undecidedly. I felt I had him at a disadvantage, had caught him in a mood of indiscretion, and to tell the truth, I was not curious to learn what might have driven a young medical student out of London. I have an imagination. I shrugged my shoulders and turned away. Over the taft rail lent a silent black figure watching the stars. It was Montgomery's strange attendant. It looked over its shoulder quickly with my movement, then looked away again. It may seem a little thing to you, perhaps, but it came like a sudden blow to me. The only light near us was a lantern at the wheel. The creature's face was turned for one brief instant out of the dimness of the stern towards this illumination, and I saw that the eyes that glanced at me shone with a pale green light. I did not know then that a reddish luminosity, at least, is not uncommon in the human eye. The thing came to me as stark inhumanity. The black figure with its eyes a fire struck down through all my adult thoughts and feelings, and for a moment the forgotten horror of childhood came back to my mind. Then the effect passed. As it had come, an uncouth black figure of a man, a figure of no particular import, hung over taft rail against the starlight, and I found Montgomery was speaking to me. I'm thinking of turning in then, he said, if you've had enough of this. I answered him encouragingly. We went below, and he wished me good night at the door of my cabin. That night I had some very unpleasant dreams. The waning moon rose late. Its light struck a ghostly white beam across my cabin and made an ominous shape on the planking by my bunk. Then the staghounds woke and began howling and baying, so that I dreamt fitfully and scarcely slept until the approach of dawn. 5. The man who had nowhere to go. In the early morning, it was the second morning after my recovery, and I believe the fourth after I was picked up, I awoke through an avenue of tumultuous dreams dreams of guns and howling mobs, and became sensible of a horse shouting above me. I rubbed my eyes and lay listening to the noise, doubtful for a little while of my whereabouts. Then came a sudden pattering of bare feet, the sound of heavy objects being thrown about, a violent creaking and the rattling of chains. I heard the swish of the water as the ship was suddenly brought round and a foamy yellow-green wave flew across the little round window and left it streaming. I jumped into my clothes and went on deck. As I came up the ladder, I saw against the flush sky, for the sun was just rising, the broad back and red hair of the captain, and over his shoulder, the puma spinning from a tackle rigged on the mizzen spanker boom. The poor brute seemed horribly scared and crouched in the bottom of its cage. Overboard with him, bawled the captain. Overboard with him. We'll have a clean ship soon of, of the whole pilot of him. He stood in my way so that I had perforce to tap his shoulder to come on deck. He came round with a start and staggered back a few paces to stare at me. It needed no expert eye to tell the man was still drunk. Allo, he said stupidly, and then with light coming into his eye, why, it's, it's Mr. Mr. Prendick, I said. Prendick, be damned, he said. Shut up, that's your name. Mr. Shut up. It was no good answering the brute, but I certainly did not expect his next move. He held out his hand to the gangway, by which Montgomery stood talking to a massive gray-haired man in a dirty blue flannels, who had apparently just come aboard. 
This way, Mr. Blasted Shut Up. That way, roared the captain. Montgomery and his companion turned as he spoke. Oh, what do you mean? That way, Mr. Blasted Shut Up. That's what I mean. Overboard, Mr. Shut Up. And sharp. We're cleaning the ship out. Cleaning the whole blessed ship out. And overboard you go. I stared at him dumbfounded. Then it occurred to me that it was exactly the thing I wanted. The last prospect of a journey as a sole passenger with this quarrelsome sot was not one to mourn over. I turned towards Montgomery. Can't have you, said Montgomery's companion concisely. You can't have me, I said aghast. He had the squarest and most resolute face I'd ever set upon. Look here, I began, turning to the captain. Overboard, said the captain. This shape ain't for beasts and cannibals and worse than beasts any more. Overboard you go, Mr. Shut Up. If they can't have you, you go overboard. But anyhow, you go with your friends. I've done with this blessed island forevermore. Amen. I've had enough of it. But, Montgomery, I appealed, his distorted lower lip and nodded his head hopelessly at the gray-haired man beside him to indicate his powerlessness to help me. I'll see you presently, said the captain. Then began a curious three-cornered altercation. Alternatively, I appealed to one and another of the three men, first to the gray-haired man to let me land, and then to the drunken captain to keep me aboard. I even bawled entries to the sailor. Montgomery never said a word, only shook his head. You're going overboard, I tell ya, was the captain's refrain. Law be damned, I'm king here. At last, I must confess, my voice suddenly broke in the middle of a vigorous threat. I felt a gust of hysterical petulance, and went aft and stared dismally at nothing. Meanwhile, the sailors progressed rapidly with the task of unshipping the packages and caged animals. A large launch with two standing lugs lay under the lee of the schooner, and into this strange assortment of goods were swung. I did not s then see the hands from the island that were receiving the packages, for the hull from the launch was hidden from me by the side of the schooner. Neither Montgomery nor his companion looked the slightest notice at me, but busied themselves in assisting and directing the four or five sailors who were unloading the goods. The captain went forward, interfering rather than assisting. I was alternating despair and desperate. Once or twice as I stood there waiting for things to accomplish themselves, I could not risk an impulse to laugh at my miserable quandary. I felt all the wretched for the lack of a breakfast. Hunger and a lack of blood corpuscles takes all the manhood from a man. I perceived pretty clearly that I had not the stamina either to resist. What the captain chose to do, to expel me or to force myself upon Montgomery and his companions, so I waited passively upon fate, and the work of transferring Mr. Montgomery's possessions to the launch went on as if I didn't exist. Presently that work was finished, and then came a struggle. I was hauled, resisting, weakly enough to the gangway. Even then I noticed the oddness of the brown faces of the men who were with Montgomery in the launch. But the launch was now fully laden and was shoved off hastily. A broadening gap of green water appeared under me, and I pushed back with all my strength to avoid falling headlong. The hands on the launch shouted derisively, and I heard Montgomery cursing at them, and then the captain... The mate and one of the seamen helping him ran me aft towards the stern. The dinghy of the Lady Vane had been towing behind. It was half full of water, had no oars, and was quite unvictualled. I refused to go aboard her and flung myself full length on the deck. In the end they swung me into her by a rope, for they had no stern ladder. And then they cut me adrift. I drifted slowly from the schooner. In a kind of stupor, I watched all hands take to the rigging, and slowly but surely she came round to the wind. The sails fluttered, and then belied out as the wind came into them. 
I stared at her weather-beaten side, healing steeply towards me, and then she passed out of my range of view. I did not turn my head to follow her. At first I could scarcely believe what had happened. I crouched at the bottom of the dinghy, stunned, and stared blankly at the vacant, oily sea. Then I realized that I was in that little hell of mine again, now half swamped, looking back over the gunwale. I saw the schooner standing away with me. I saw the schooner standing away from me with the red-haired captain mocking at me over the ta over the taffrail and turning towards the island. Saw the launch growing smaller as she approached the beach. Abruptly, the cruelty of this desertion became clear to me. I had no means of reaching the land unless I should chance to drift there. I was still weak, you must remember, from my exposure in the boat. I was empty and very faint, where I should have been more heart. But as I was suddenly beginning to sob and weep, as I had never done since I was a little child, the tears ran down my face. In a passion of despair, I struck with my fist at the water at the bottom of the boat and kicked savagely at the gunwale. I prayed aloud for God to let me die. Chapter 6 The Evil-Looking Boatman But the islanders, seeing that I was really adrift, took pity on me. I drifted very close to the eastward, approaching the island slantly, and presently I saw, with hysterical relief, the launch come round and return towards me. She was heavily laden, and I could make out, as she drew near, Montgomery's white-haired, broad-shouldered companion, sitting cramped up with the dogs and several package casings in the stern sheets. This individual stared fixedly at me without moving or speaking. The black-faced cripple was glaring at me fixedly in the bow, near the puma. There were three other men besides, three strange, brutish-looking fellows, at whom the staghounds were snarling savagely. Montgomery, who was steering, brought the boat by me, and, rising, caught and fastened my painter to the till to tow me, for there was no room aboard. I had recovered from my hysterical phase by this time, and answered his hail. As he approached bravely enough, I told him the dinghy was nearly swamped, and he reached me in a piggin. I was jerked back as the rope tightened between the boats. For some time... I was busy bailing, for it was not until I had gotten the water under, for the water in the dinghy had been shipped. The boat was perfectly sound, that I had leisure to look at the people in the launch again. The white-haired man I found was still regarding me steadfastly, but with an expression, I now fancied, of some perplexity. When my eyes met him, he looked down at the staghound that sat between his knees. He was powerfully built man, as I have said, with a fine forehead and a rather heavy features, but his eyes had that odd drooping of the skin above the lids, which often came with advancing years, and the fall of his heavy mouth at the corners gave an expression of pugnacious resolution. He talked to Montgomery in a tone too low for me to hear. From him my eyes traveled to his three men, a strange crew they were. I saw only their faces, yet there was something in their faces. I knew not what that gave me a queer spasm of disgust. I looked steadily at them, and the impression did not pass, though I failed to see what had occasioned it. They seemed to me to be brown men, but their limbs were oddly swathed in some thin, dirty white stuff down even to the fingers and feet. I'd never seen men so wrapped up before, and women so only in the East. They wore turbans, too, and there under peered out their elfin faces at me, faces with protruding lower jaws and bright eyes. They had lank black hair, almost like horse hair, and seemed as they sat to exceed in stature any race of men I have seen. The white-haired man, who I knew was a good six feet in height, sat a head below any one of the three. I found afterwards that really none were taller than myself, but their bodies were abnormally long, 
and the thigh part of the leg short and curiously twisted. At any rate, they were amazingly ugly gang, and over the heads of them, under the forward lug, peered the black face of the man whose eyes were luminous in the dark. As I stared at them, they met my gaze, and then the first one, and then another turned away from my direct stare and looked at me in an odd, furtive manner. It occurred to me that I was perhaps annoying them, and I had turned my attention to the island we were approaching. It was low and covered with thick vegetation, chiefly a kind of palm that was new to me. From one point of view, a thin white thread of vapor rose slanting to an immense height and then frayed out like a down feather. We were now within the embrace of a broad bay, flanked on either hand by a low promontory. The beach was of dull gray sand and sloped steeply up a ridge, perhaps sixty or seventy feet above sea level, and the irregularity set with trees and undergrowth Halfway up was a square enclosed of some grayish stone, which I found subsequently was built partly of coral and partly of pumice lava. Two thatched roofs peeked from within this enclosure. A man stood awaiting us at the water's edge. I fancied, while we were still far off, that I saw some other and very grotesque-looking creatures scuttle into the bushes upon the slope but I saw nothing of these as we drew nearer. This man was of moderate size, and with a black face. He had large, almost lipless mouth with extraordinary lank arms, long, thin feet, and bow legs, and stood with his heavy face thrust forward, staring at us. He was dressed like Montgomery and his white-haired companion, in jacket and trousers of blue serge. As we came still nearer, this individual began to run to and fro on the beach, making the most grotesque movements. At a word of command from Montgomery, the four men in the launch sprang up and, with singularly awkward gestures, struck the lugs. Montgomery steered us round and into a narrow little dock, excavated in the beach. Then the man on the beach hastened towards us. This dock, as I call it, was really a mere ditch just long enough at this phase of the tide to take the long boat. I heard the bows ground in the sand, staved the dinghy off the rudder of the big boat with my piggin, and freeing the painter, landed. The three muffled men, with the clumsiest movements, scrambled out upon the sand, and forthwith set to landing the cargo, assisted by the man on the beach. I was struck especially by the curious movements of the legs of the three swarthed and bandished boatmen. Not stiff they were, but distorted in some odd way, almost as if they were joined in the wrong place. The dog was still snarling and straining at the chains after these men, as the white-haired men landed with them. The three big fellows spoke to one another in the odd, guttural tone and the man who had waited for us on the beach began chattering to them excitedly, a foreign language, as I fancied, as they laid hand on some bales piled near the stern. Somewhere I had heard such a voice before, and I could not think where. The white hand man stood, holding in a tumult of six dogs, and bawling orders over their dim. Montgomery, having unshipped the rudder, landed likewise, and all set to work unloading. I was too faint, what with my long fast and the sun beating down on my bare head, to offer any assistance. Presently the white-haired man seemed to recall my presence, and came up to me. "'You look,' he said, "'as though you had scarcely breakfast. His eyes were a brilliant black under his heavy brows. I must apologize for that.' Now you are our guest, we must make you comfortable, though you are uninvited, you know. He looked keenly into my face. Montgomery says you are an educated man, Mr. Prendick. Says you know something of science. May I ask what that signifies? I told him I had spent some years at the Royal College of Science and had done some research in biology under Huxley. He raised his eyebrows slightly at that. 
That alters the case a little, Mr. Brendick, he said with a trifle more respect in his manner. As it happens, we are biologists here. This is a biological station, of a sort. His eye rested on the men, in white who were busily hauling the puma on rollers towards the walled yard. I and Montgomery, at least, he added. Then, when will you be able to get away? I can't say. We're off the track to anywhere. We see a ship once in a twelve months or so. He left me abruptly and went up the beach past this group, and I think entered the enclosure. The other two men were, with Montgomery, erecting a pile of smaller packages on a low-wheeled truck. The llama was still on the launch with the rabbit hutches. The staghounds were still leashed to the thwart. The pile of things completed. All three men laid hold of the truck and began shoving the ton weight or so upon after the puma. Presently Montgomery left them, and coming back to me held out his hand. I'm glad, he said, for my own part. That captain was a silly ass. He'd have made things lively for you. It was you, I said, that saved me again. A lot depends. You'll find this island an infernal rum place, I promise you. I'd watch my goings carefully if I were you. He... He hesitated and seemed to alter his mind about what was on his lips. I wish you'd help me with these rabbits, he said. His procedure with the rabbits was singular. I waded in with him and helped him lug one of the hutches ashore. No sooner was that done than he opened the door of it and tilted the thing on one end, turning its living contents out on the ground. They fell in a struggling heap, one on top of the other. He clapped his hands, and forthwith they went off with that hopping run of theirs. Fifteen or twenty of them, I should think, up the beach. Increase and multiply, my friend, said Montgomery. Replenish the island. Hitherto we've had a certain lack of meats here. As I watched them disappear, the white-haired man returned with a brandy flask and some biscuits. Mm, something to go on with, Brendick, he said, in a far more familiar tone than before. I made no ado, but set to work on the biscuits at once, while the white-haired man helped Montgomery to release a score more of rabbits. Three big hutches, however, went up to the house with the puma. The brandy I did not touch, for I had been an abstainer from my birth. So quoth, this raven. Oh, this is fun. And of course, they would use people they deemed... Well, we won't go into spoilers, will we? I'm sure everybody knows what it's about, but... It is Victorian times, so... Human rights were um, not considered universal. Who am I kidding? They're not today either. Anyway, have a lovely weekend, my darlings. Thank you for stopping by, my darlings. It means so much. I so enjoy telling these stories for you. And here are some of my marvelous supporters. Please, if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so. If you give this video a like, it would help me out ever so much. Thank you. And have a lovely, lovely day.